to when he says, if you call on the Father. So Peter is assuming that his readers are doing that, that they are following the instructions of both Jesus and Paul to call on the Father. Paul said, God sent his spirit into our hearts to lead us to cry, Abba, Father. Prayer is what calling on the Father means. Prayer is the natural response of faith. And it's one of the most amazing opportunities that God has given us. Jeremiah said, call unto me, speaking, God speaking to Jeremiah, and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. Your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask. So Peter then echoed Paul's teachings on the judgment seat of Christ. Where we will all give account of our deeds. He reminds his readers that the Heavenly Father is an impartial and all-knowing judge. So if you call on the Father then, is sandwiched or bracketed by two responsibilities. The one just before in verse 16 is be holy. And in this one, it's live with fear. So in between calling on the Father, we are to be holy and we are to live with fear. So our prayer life should lead us to live holy to reflect Him and to display fear to honor Him. For how long? Well, Peter says, throughout the time of your stay here, which sort of emphasizes to us that this is temporary and it is brief, but God expects us to be faithful the entire time we live here on earth. So look at verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So he says, knowing this. So knowing what we know is the foundation for how we live. Every one of us here made some decisions this morning. What we put on, what we consumed, what we were expecting when we came to church, where we parked, where we picked a seat in the new arrangements. Everything that you do is affected by what you know or what you think. So he wants to make sure that they know a theological doctrinal truth that they have been redeemed with something incorruptible. Doctrine and theology were important in Peter's day. They were important in the early church. They were important in the days of the Reformation. And they are important today, even if we feel like theology and doctrine don't really apply, they do. Theology and doctrine is the foundation of what we know, and what we know affects how we live. And doctrine and theology, whether it's recognized or not, will be important a generation from now as well. The word redeemed is the word lutero in Greek, and it means to purchase the release of someone by paying a price, or to deliver a payment for a price. It refers to the price an Israelite family would pay at Passover so that their child could live. They would pay the Passover lamb and redeem their child from the just judgment of God on Egypt. So you and I have been bought with the price. We're not our own, as Paul told the Corinthians and Galatians. We belong to God. And we're not redeemed with, with man's futile things. We're not redeemed with our attempts to self-justify ourselves or, or to give offerings or to make sacrifices or to good, do good deeds. We are redeemed by something incorruptible. None of man's systems of uh, making their life better, turning over a new leaf, making a change, can compare to the incorruptible and precious blood of Jesus Christ. And you don't really hear a lot about the blood of Christ anymore in modern expressions of Christianity. It has sort of gone out of style, but I can guarantee you the blood of Christ has not gone out of style with God. The, the entire gospel and the Old Testament sacrifices are based on sin requires a blood sacrifice, but no man's blood is good enough, so the Lord Jesus had to die to provide us salvation. And because of that, Paul said to the Corinthians, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might have the righteousness of God before him. Then he comes to verse 20. 
And this is where he gets deeper. We're not going to expand on this or expound on it because we did this a couple of weeks ago. But he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So this Lord Jesus, who is the sacrifice, who is the price of redemption, he was foreordained to be that and do that before God even made the world. And that's emphasized in Ephesians 1, 4, Revelation 13, 8, and Revelation 17, 8. And he was foreordained. His death was foreordained. Our salvation was foreordained before God created the world. Now, why is that important? Peter is trying to tell them, get ready for difficult times. He mentions suffering some 16 times in this small, short book. He knows suffering is coming. They have to have their lives rooted in something more powerful than we can get through this and this is going to pass. Because in their lifetimes, it did not pass. It lasted for centuries. Their children endured suffering. Their grandchildren endured suffering. Horrific persecution. So how do you stand in those kind of days by knowing that you and your redemption was foreordained before the foundation of the world? So God was not caught off guard by the revolt of Satan, by the betrayal of the angels, by the fall of Adam and Eve. He wasn't caught off guard by the decadence that happened before the flood or the defiant arrogance at Babel or the rise of empires throughout human history or the unfaithfulness of Israel or the rejection of his son. God knew all along that was going to happen. And he said it was manifest in these times, this purchase, this price, this redemption, this redeemer was manifested for you now, although he was foreordained before I made anything. In John 1.14, the Bible says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in these last times, that's simply a phrase that means the last phase before the millennial reign of Christ. Verse 21, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Through him, Jesus, through him you have this belief in God. Through him, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. And as oppositional as it seems and confrontational as it seems and exclusive as it sounds, To respond to those who say everybody's going to go to heaven, the Bible just boldly states there's only one way, and it's Jesus, and that's why Jesus came to die. And the Bible then says that God raised him from the dead. And this is one of those subtle reflections of the deity of Christ. Because listen to what Jesus said. I am the resurrection and the life. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all those he has given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up at the last day. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. This is why the Jews wanted to stone him. Christ openly declared, I am one with the Father. When the Bible says God raised him from the dead, then Jesus says, yes, he did. I raised myself. There's no other way to interpret that than he is God. Then the Bible there says that he gave him glory. The first indication of that was the book of Acts after he gave that last sermon and he ascended up into heaven in front of 500 people. And the angels asked those men, why are you looking up into heaven? He's going to come back the same way. So our faith and our hope are in God. The Bible says in this passage, Peter's writing, this has all happened through him so that your faith and hope will be in God and not in yourselves, not in your heritage, not in your racial genetic background, but in God. The provision for salvation, the sacrifice of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the impartation of the Holy Spirit, the imputation of righteousness, these are all possible because the Father has willed it and our faith is to be in Him. So we come to verse 22. 
since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, and the sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, since you have obeyed the truth. The truth here is not the Old Testament law. The truth he's referring to is the truth of Jesus Christ. Because the law was pointing to Jesus. Paul said the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So the ultimate truth he's saying you've obeyed is Jesus Christ. Understanding who he is, embracing him for who he is, and then worshiping him. So obedience to the truth is the response of brokenness, repentance, submission, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ then true saving faith does something. It creates a love of the brethren. Loving one another is a result of obeying the gospel. So Jesus said it was not only a command and a great command given to us, it's also the evidence that you have been made a child of God. John said you can't even be a believer if you don't love one another. So we are to love sincerely and fervently. The sincerely, uh, the Greek word is Anuo krypton, and the simpler form is hypocrite. And hypocrite sounds like an English word, hypocrite. And the meaning is the same. It means do not love like a hypocrite. Do not wear a mask. Although we're doing it, don't wear a, a mask. Don't be hypocritical. Don't be duplicitous. Don't have a dual agenda. Don't be self serving. So that word sincerely means be real. Don't be false. Love each other sincerely. Then the word fervently. And it's a, it's a muscular word, ektenos in Greek. And it's referring to a muscular movement. So love sincerely and fervently. And the way you would look at that is you, you're to love with all that you are and to love with a hearty hug. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily it's physically because you know even now we're not supposed to do that. But the Bible tells us to love each other with some passion with some energy and zeal. Verse 23 through 25. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and, it, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Born again. One of the most iconic and simplistic yet profound phrases in the New Testament. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said in John chapter 1 that we are to be born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The born again experience which simply occurs when the spirit of man responds to the message of the spirit of Christ and we realize that he is Lord and we are not. He is righteous and we are not. He is the king and we are his subjects. And we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That born again of a seed. Seed refers to that which generates life. In both plant, animal, and human reproduction. But all those are perishable. So he says this is an incorruptible seed. Not affected by age, environment, and uh, circumstances. And he says that seed is the word of God. Hebrews tells us the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The psalmist said his word is forever settled in heaven and it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Jesus said not one jot or tittle will pass until all is fulfilled. And then Paul told us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Peter then says, Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. So the gospel shares the same divine source that inspired the prophets. It shares the same power and the authority of their message. And he wanted his readers to know that what you believe the men and the women that you respect and honor and revere from ancient times, the, the godly men and women who followed Moses and Abraham and, and um, the prophets, this is the fulfillment of their message. It is not anything new. 
It's a new revelation of the same truth, but now it's fulfilled. So as Peter is writing to these readers who are about to go through the great persecution under Nero, he wants them to know there's something more important than your physical life, than your physical survival. It is your rebirth in Jesus Christ because of the power of the Word of God. Let that be your foundation. Let that be your roots. And if you call on the Father who loves you more than your earthly father ever could, if you call on your Father, believe these things, trust these things, hold on to these things, and you'll be able to please Him and survive in faith. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the wonderful privilege to be your children. We thank you that by your will, by your foreordination, you made salvation possible. Christ paid the price, your spirit convicted us, and you drew us to yourself through your Son. And because of that, we can have new life. And I pray for everyone in this room those who are still pondering what it means to be a believer in Jesus, those who are wondering if they should do it, and those who are wondering sometimes if it was the right decision. May you, for each one of us, deepen our faith in the concrete, um, unchangeable truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, even as all the other truths around us seem to dissipate and fade. May we anchor our souls in the gospel, that we might be loving, kind, gracious, firm, strong, bold, light, and salt to our culture. Father, once again, we do ask you to bless every father and mother here in the room. Help each one of us do what we can to honor our mothers and fathers. And then may we use that to turn our eyes to you and, and realize that you love us more than any father or mother could because you are our heavenly father who's also our impartial judge. Let me ask you to keep your heads bowed for just a moment. I just would like for you to consider what you've heard today. It may have just been one phrase or one point that sort of touched your heart, but ask God to help you internalize what he may have impressed upon you today. Ask him to anchor your faith so that you can endure whatever trials might be coming your way. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the promise of your word, the presence of your spirit, and the wonderful joy we have to love with one another and assemble together. And we thank you for that privilege in Jesus' name. Amen. For all those who are watching on live stream, I want to thank everyone here who came and wore their mask. You don't need to wear it while you're seated, but many of you did, and that's fine. But thank you for honoring that request. If you have not yet attended one of our service, we want you to know it's a safe place to come. You know, there's so much information. It's so conflicting. I don't think we're ever going to know really what the full truth is as to the nature of COVID-19 or the real threat of COVID-19. It might take years for that all unplays or plays out. But we need to be sensitive to one another, and we're trying to do that here and, and remain safe. So if you come here, you'll see people are wearing masks when they come in and when they leave, and then they're seated without the mask. And I hope you'll be with us next Sunday or maybe even this Wednesday night. Let's all please stand together. We don't have a song, right? No? I, let's all please stand together. We don't hug and handshake now for a little bit longer. We're going to delay that a little longer, but one of these days we'll be able to give each other a good hearty handshake. And, uh, but you can certainly smile through your eyes and let them know that you're glad to see them. Thank each one of you for coming today, and let's make sure we share the gospel with somebody this week. God bless you, and have a wonderful day.